Hello friend and welcome to another episode of the Bonsai Podcast by Blue Nose Trading. I'm your host Tori Solis and today I'm going to be talking with Rebecca Pepez about her journey and process as a ceramic artist. I really enjoyed this deep dive with Becca into her work life and interests so let's jump right in. Hey Becca, how's it going? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing excellent. So Becca, tell me how you got started in ceramics in general and how'd you get your hands in the clay? Well, I started at a very young age. I believe I was about 12 and that was middle school for me. And I basically started taking not private classes because it was like a small group of kids at a Mm -hmm. local pottery shop. And I was really bad. I actually was terrible. But I loved it so much that I decided maybe I could get better at this if I keep at it. So for a couple years, I took those classes and I slowly improved. And then eventually I could get a membership there because I was old enough. And now, fast forward a couple years later, I'm making pottery. Sweet. Are you still with that same studio? Yeah. So actually that studio um, moved locations. It didn't move too far. It moved like a, a mile or two. And I'm still at the same, the owner also changed. So I'm still at the same place, even though it's at a different location, but there's a different owner as well. But I've been at that same entity ever since I started in when I was 12. That's awesome. Did you learn to throw or hand build first or which I think I did throwing first and hand building. I learned when I was taking ceramics in school. So partially middle school and a little, and a little bit of high school as well. Nice. I I started on the wheel as well. I think the wheel is probably the hardest thing to learn just because there's so many delicate steps that require a lot of not concentration but like muscle memory to get things done correctly because if you wobble your piece it's really hard to fix it and then of course fixing it takes another step of um, skill and if you don't fix it it gets worse as you progress throughout your piece (laughs) so it's like oh no we might as well start over but you don't really learn that until you realize like hey this is not fixable I have to start over (laughs) <laughs> and that's like a whole nother mindset. So it's it took a while to get to where I'm at. Oh yeah, for sure. I flopped. I flopped a lot of pots. Oh man, I hate <laughs> flopping because you don't see it until like the very last second, and you're like, "But I'm so invested," and you just got to start over. I know. I'm all, I'm a more of like a I catch it without enough water, and then it'll catch my finger, and I I'll tear it because it was too Ooh. thin somewhere, and I'm like, "Oh no." Yeah. But I'm... hand building is is tough. I haven't built too any like anything too extravagant with hand building. It's very simple, like, um, like cubes or boxes or rectangular stuff. So it's not like, oh, I've done an octagon. Like that would be a challenge. But for the know. most part, it's very simple. Cut out s- stuff from slabs, put it together, and then add your drainers holes and tie down holes, and you're good to go. I tried to make uh, ovals. I've kind of started an oval adventure adventure here personally, and slabs make me so upset. They are so sassy. They can be, depending upon the clay. Like, it could be either warp while it's drying or crack because you put too much pressure on it when it was too dry. There's too many things or too many ways to mess up just one slab. Definitely. They have a lot of... Uh... I'm just like, when I throw it on the wheel, I'm like, there it is. And with the slab, it's just like it wants to be babied and princess, and I'm yep. still... I'm still... I'm, I'm still, I'm just, I feel very confident on the wheel, so I feel like the flip side, like I'm still like learning slabs, and I look at the slabs, and I'm like, we're gonna work together, and you're gonna hurt my feelings. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> how I feel sometimes, where I'm like, oh, I don't know if this is gonna work out too well. Sometimes I've done ovals with like, wheel thrown walls, and then I take off the walls from the bat, smush it a little bit to form an oval, and then put it on a slab, and that's usually okay. But again, there's been some complications with like contact or just too much pressure on the slab that was too dry. So it's really hard to find like a happy medium. I'm, I'm right there. I'm there with you right there. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one struggling because it's definitely oh, no. like, <laughs> it's a dance. Oh, no. No, definitely. No, I'm very open with all my struggles. I made a, a, an oval and I made a YouTube video for it. It hasn't come out, but I like. I pulled the oval out of the kiln and I was all happy and it was like, whoop, all bowed up. I was like, oh. well, I'm going to post it anyway. Yeah. This is what, this is That's what it is. That's the part of the process is warbage and it it's really hard to predict definitely. sometimes. So where do you find the inspiration for your work? So a lot of the inspiration I get is usually from like Pottery Making Illustrated or Potter or Ceramic Monthly. It's just like um, a company that releases like magazines on how to do stuff or other artists emerging in the ceramic um theme and then there's also just the potter shop i work at it's a community 
So there's a lot of other stuff going on there than just me making my bonsai pots. And a lot of people give me like insight on like what you could try or tips and tricks or just showing me their work. And I say, hey, I should try that one time. Like that style it looks really cool. Um, also, a lot of my hobbies and interests outside of ceramics gives me uh, some ideas. So like I do like the Japanese culture and a lot of their um, cultural um, takes kind of flow into my um, pottery sometimes, but other times I put my own spin on things. So it's really a mix. That's sweet. How'd you get into Japanese culture? I think it started also when I was pretty young. Um, my brothers, they loved the show Pokemon. I don't know if you've heard of that. And Pokemon is a Japanese anime. Baby tattoo here. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's basically started with the show Pokemon. I'm like, oh, this is a really cool concept. I enjoy it. And obviously Pokemon is very famous today, but there are a bunch of other Japanese animes I enjoy. And then I learned more about the culture because I wanted to learn more about how they drew the anime. And then there was manga and it kind of spread out from there. I love that journey that you were on. Yeah, it was definitely like one spark of information from one source and it just kind of spiderwebbed into everything else. I love Pokemon. I ended up into it without context. How It's really crazy. In third grade, I think it was, some boy on the school bus gave me a Game Boy Color. With he just Pokemon. gave it to you? Yeah, I think he had a crush on me. Oh my gosh. Time. But I don't want to sound too like full of me. But <laughs> he gave me a Game Boy Color with Pokemon Red in it. And he was like, here you go. Like, and he gave it to me. And I was, I've never, I'd never had any kind of video game before. And I'd never played, had any contact with pokemon or anything and like i played through pokemon red uh, just you know whatever just out of the blue charmander for the record and nice when i played through pokemon red as a third uh third grader i did not know that you could use the pokemon center to heal <gasps> i played through that entire game KOing myself to heal so <laughs> what <like, laughs> that's kind of like a like a like a um an achievement like that's really hard to do because that's a lot of money for the potions and everything yes mm -hmm. i did not know i did not know that you could heal at the pokemon center with the lady i'd never figured it out until like way later and i also never found flash so like oh I my went goodness through... that's another <laughs> achievement <laughs> i went through the whole cave with no healing nothing but potions and i just like i learned if you touch the left and you keep walking on the left of the wall, you will eventually circle the entire cave and find the exit. Oh, but that's that's probably the longer route. <laughs> oh, yeah. yes. Oh, my gosh. Sure. I feel like that's a very interesting way to enter in the video game um, obsession. But I think you did a good job considering the downfalls. I beat the game. <laughs> I did beat the game. Nice. Uh, yeah, the OGs are the best. Um, I play a lot of, like, I have a Nintendo Switch. So Sweet. I play a lot of um, like Splatoon, Star Fox, Zelda, all the good stuff. Nice. I have a Switch too. I love that. So how did you get into you got so I'm I'm guessing you got into calligraphy just by following the the culture lines? Yeah. So calligraphy, I do English and Japanese. One is with like a mm. pen and ink and the other is brush and ink. So they're kind of different. They both have ink, but the writing instrument is different. But you can kind of also have calligraphy with your bonsai and your bonsai pottery. Because some people will display, like, scrolls with um, poems on them next to their tree. So I haven't sold, like, a pair yet, but I want to get there where I can, like, sell a pot with some calligraphy and then you can put your tree in it and then it's kind of like a trio. That's awesome. I really yeah. like that concept. It would be really cool to see that play out. Um, it's hard to do because not everyone wants the same poem written the same way. And, of course, depending upon the tree, it's like, there's a lot of factors. But I'm hoping to get there one day. That's awesome. I don't know a whole lot about scrolls, so I'm going to ask you some questions. <laughs> okay. So how is the poetry chosen? Is it, do you kind of choose, or are there certain ones that are normally chosen? Or? There's like some famous poetry written by some Japanese poets, either from long, long ago or recently, or even just phrases translated into like Japanese, and then you write it on a scroll. There's no like right poem or wrong poem. It depends on if you're mm -hmm. doing like, a sentence or a phrase that's more colloquial or an actual like haiku um yes. but it doesn't necessarily matter what's written i've seen in our local our local like pottery bonsai pottery slash bonsai um shows someone had like a guitar like anatomy of an electric guitar hung up next to their tree and it looks really cool 
because even though it was kind of like out there, it's still kind of tied in with the tree vibes and the pop vibes. So I was like, yeah, that's actually kind of a cool concept. Was it a wooden guitar? I think it was like an electric, like metal and okay, not not like a traditional wooden electric guitar. I gotcha. I just, I yeah, gotcha. yeah. I was just those. thinking that like conceptually, like those uh those tones that people look for in really nice instruments, like they come mm-hmm. from some of those really old trees. And, you know, there's, like, a, a kind of a message there. Yeah, it might have had some wood, like, undertones and, like, accents, because I didn't look too closely at it, because my guitar anatomy isn't that great. Like, knowledge on that isn't that great. But I, it's, I still thought it was a cool concept. I agree. It's very cool. So, do you... I don't know anything about the Japanese um, script of writing. Are the characters, like, their phrases for characters, right? So there is a alphabet, it's sound instead of like letters, and they're called syllabaries. The two basic ones you learn are hiragana and katakana. They have the same sounds, but there's one's like a general script and the other is a cursive script. So there is that plus the kanji, and kanji is just characters taken from the Chinese language used in the Japanese language. Okay. Kanji is basically the complex like multiple stroke characters that you see next to the hiragana or katakana. That is such an amazing thing to teach yourself. Yeah, um, it took me a couple years. I started really young though. That's probably why I learned so fast. I think I started also when I was about like 12 or 13. And I was like, oh, I have the books. I have the resources. I can just read all up and and it all stuck pretty well. So I'm like, you know, this is pretty good. I'm still learning kanji because you have to know about like 10,000 to be considered like a decent reader. And yeah. because of the way kanji works, it's not just like, oh, it's one kanji and has one reading. Kanji usually has a couple readings, depending upon what other kanji is paired with. So it gets a little difficult. But once you kind of get the system down and you kind of remember what kanji looks like, especially what different kanji together looks like, you kind of create this memory of, oh, OK, I know what that word is because it has this and this and that sounds like this. You have an amazing mind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. My brain feels like spaghetti sometimes trying to learn. Well, don't forget, there's a lot of Japanese people out there who know Japanese. So it's not oh, it's not an impossible task, it's but true. it's definitely not an easy one. That's very true. I, you are absolutely correct. More, most people know more than one language. It's almost a little embarrassing that I only know one and a half. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, you just got to work on it. It's not, it's not um, something that is super, like pressured unless you're in school of course but Mm -hmm. i think it'd be fun to just know a couple um languages just for the usefulness and the versatility of it i love being able to approach people uh on their in their in their their language when when i can it feels very respectful like like taking the time to learn more about someone's language and culture and roots and being able to greet them or say talk to them in their own language i work on i live in texas so i work on my spanish a lot oh yeah i'm i'm married into a uh, a mexican family and i'm i really would like to be able to connect more with some of the family members of mine that don't speak as much english so Mm. i work i've been working on it but that's good that's good people appreciate the the hard work you put behind it because i think a lot of people know that not everyone is just capable of learning multiple languages especially at a fast pace it's not necessarily like a general like cookie cutter thing to do so for some people who really put the time and effort behind it they recognize that and they appreciate it i think i agree and and also it's just i think there's a window of time when you're a kid where it's a little bit easier oh for sure your brain's more like absorbent at that point because you're basically learning your first language and you need to be able to just just swallow all the different types of words and how grammar works and all sorts of things. Whereas Absolutely. when you're a bit older, those have solidified and it's a little bit tricky to broaden your horizons on a language or languages. Definitely. Well, I respect everybody who knows any more than one language or parts of them. It's, it's excellent. So how did you come up with your logo? It's a really cool logo. Oh, yeah. Um, that actually has some Japanese undertones in it. So <laughs> there's this cool thing back in the back in the day when I think uh, Japan was more feudal. They would have these family crests and the family crests would depict something that had to do with their family's work, which basically what they did for a living. And a lot of it had like boats or rice grains or maybe even they were a samurai. So they had a helmet or swords and blades crossing. 
Um, this one is very unique because it didn't really have any of that elements in it, mostly because I can't associate with any of those things. Uh, it's it's basically a bird, but it's kind of entangled into itself, so it's more of like a complex symbol for like being free, if that makes sense. Because birds that. represent freedom, but it's also like entangled in itself, so it's like a freedom that's also self-sustained, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So like you 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 work to sustain your freedom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I feel I vibe with that. Uh, so I, I I heard from an unreliable source that my name means bird in Japanese. Can you confirm? Just is Tori. Oh yeah, Tori. Yeah, I actually one of my favorite artists that made Dragon Ball, Akira Toriyama. Tori is a bird. So and Yama means mountain. So he's a a mountain bird. Oh, I love that. Like, yeah. I can sweet sweet confirmation oh yeah for sure people now <laughs> <laughs> i was always so mad my name didn't mean anything and then i found out that it might mean bird in japanese which now i know it does oh for sure great because i'm a bird person oh that's even oh look at that that's ironic i love them i have chickens ducks uh, i have a parrot i hear birds are pretty smart too like they're not they are so great they and their memory is amazing as well they're ornery i respect them <laughs> mm-hmm so in your studio, as you were learning from 12 to now, did you have any special teachers, heroes, mentors, or people on your journey that really stuck out to help you? Um, Nothing too, like, I don't know how to put this. There were definitely a lot of, like, when I was at the studio when I was younger, first learning about it, there was obviously the one teacher who was teaching everybody. So I didn't get, mm. like, super special one-on-one -on -one time. And then, of course, there were other teachers who would sub for that teacher basically just other employees who worked there and they all taught me different things which was great but they never really stuck out to like oh I want that teacher not this teacher and then I would complain about it or have a fit um and then there was also high school where there was one specific teacher I had and she was just a ceramics teacher so it wasn't like again nothing super out there or standing out but I think the, the accumulation of all those teachers I've had throughout the past really have helped shape and form my skill set today so i think i appreciate every one of them equally instead of one standing out the most that's good sounds like they were all equally excellent yeah because they each taught me like an advanced technique or a simple technique to help me advance to a new technique it was really great i kind of remember almost everything because i'm like I, re I need to get good at this i was young and i was fixating on i need to get better at this and eventually i did and i still want to improve because i feel like i could definitely make some more strides but I'm definitely at a good spot right now. Absolutely. I hope I'm always improving. I hope I'm like 80 years old and I'm learning how to do a new time to graffito or something. Like, oh, yeah. That'd be really cool. <laughs> Just to like 80 years old and be like, I never knew this. Like, that'd be so, yeah. it'd be like a feeling of like life again, you know, when you learn something yeah. new and you apply it to your life. There are so many ceramic techniques. So many. There's it's a lot. endless. I could. I feel like I could learn this for the rest of my life, literally. There's for so sure. And some of them aren't play. even techniques. They're just like tips or tricks to like prevent S cracks or make sure there's not stuff in your clay, you know, like little things that are like helpful along the way. Yeah, absolutely. One day I will dry my pots correctly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what? <laughs> Hopefully that day comes soon. Uh, right. Because <laughs> there's oh apparently it's like depending upon all the factors of like, oh, is your plastic not have holes in it or or, oh, how's the weather today? Or is this pot bigger than that pot so it'll give off more moisture, causing uneven drying? And you're like, oh, this is, this is torture. <laughs> I know. And I, like, when I, when I look up, like, how to dry pots better, uh, it's like, have you tried just, like, drying them better? <laughs> <laughs> have you tried turning it off and on again? <laughs> Right. Sometimes I make these pots with dragons on them and I can't flip them over because of the sculpture. Oh, that's right. If the dragon's still too wet, it'll smush. Sometimes, sometimes if, it, if it's not too, too delicate, I can flip it over onto like foam. But sometimes I have head spikes and pieces on them that are just, you can't, there's no flipping it. So mm, yeah, Bless. that's hard to do because you could dry it in parts. But even then, then the sturdiness and the integrity comes into play of like the piece. I've just been wrapping the whole thing in plastic and setting it on a shelf and forgetting about it for a month. And then, well, if it's wrapped really well, it'll dry pretty slow, which is a good thing. But then, if you forget about it, you might <laughs> you might knock it over. The issue is like 
for drawing big weird things slow is shelf space i mm-hmm. mean where do you where do you put all this stuff if it's gonna sit for a month so uh, stuff to overcome yes so do you keep any trees currently no uh the last few years i've tried but midwest weather is really intense especially the winters. I've actually had all my trees die before the official winter started. So it was the fall weather that killed it. But the fall weather was pretty cold and kind of like shocked my tree into death just like overnight. Or I did have a dog once and the dog peed on the tree a few times, which didn't help. And then I think one, the last one, the pot broke and I didn't know for a few days. So it wasn't in a good shape when I tried to repot it and it just didn't make it. I don't even, I, none of my trees are doing, are super successful or anything yet. I've got a few that I haven't killed, so. That's good. That's yeah. better than me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, nah, you go get, you, you just, I feel like uh, proportionately you've only, you've had way fewer and I've killed like way more. And if you had as many as me, you might have like done way better even. That's a possibility. I know yeah. like a lot of binds I, um, enthusiasts are like, oh yeah, you kill a lot of trees at the beginning. But then once you kind of grow into it, you learn how to prevent that from happening a lot easier. I really like the Little Things for Bonsai People podcast. They've helped me learn a lot. That's good. All that little information. (laughs) They're really helpful. So hopefully I'll kill fewer trees. So what does your ceramic process and studio routine look like for you? Well, it depends on what I'm doing that day. So there is either throwing, hand building, trimming, or glazing. So if I'm wheel throwing, I basically grab all the tools I need to wheel throw, get a bucket of water, choose a wheel. And of course, I prep the clay. I do need my clay a little bit, even though it comes out of a pug. Um, I just I just when I cut it in half and I form it into a ball, I want to make sure there's no air bubbles when I'm forming it. So I just re-knead it. And then I'll start throwing. Um, it, depending upon whether I want to do, work on a special order or just create another bonsai pot for fun it doesn't really matter what i'm doing specifically it's just throwing i kind of just get on the wheel and go um hand building usually is a couple days longer because you have to wait for those slabs to dry after you roll them out so i would have to get the clay i don't need as many tools um kind of just we have um oh my gosh i forgot what it was called just one of those slab rollers basically Mm -hmm. and you got to prep the clay to get it to fit in the slab roller before the slab can be rolled. So there's that part. And that, that can be a little labor intensive where you're slapping the clay for a couple minutes to make sure <laughs> it's like not too thick and then gets stuck in the slab ro- roller, but not too thin where it's like not proper evenness. Mm-hmm. And then of course you have to wait a day or two for it to dry before you can actually cut out the slabs and use them. And then trimming is what I do after I throw a piece. And it's basically when I add the feet and the little drainage droughts on the bottom to my pots and also the drainage and tie down holes. So when the piece is dry enough to flip over and to like hold itself in a, in a position upside down is when I'll turn it upside down, put it on a trimming wheel and kind of trim what I need to trim on there. It's usually just like an indentation on the bottom for water Mm -hmm. to flow out and then the droughts for the, the water to flow. And then of course the drainage hole and the tie down holes go in. Um, depending upon how thick the base is and what, the order requires if it's a special order it changes the way the feet are trimmed because sometimes i'll have a really thick bottom and then i can trim in like really big noticeable feet where other times i'll do the minimalistic like no feet look and just the droughts so it all depends on i guess what i'm in the mood for or what the person ordered and then glaze day which is technically my least favorite day (laughs) is when i get all the pieces that have been best fired which is usually like 10 to 20 maybe even 30 and I sit down and I try to get them all glazed. Um, glazing takes forever because you got to do layers. And when you add a layer, it takes longer to dry. And then, of course, if you're doing multiple layers on one piece and every layer takes longer to dry, the time just adds up. And eventually I'll be there for like five hours. <laughs> it's like, oh, wow, I glazed 10 pieces in five hours. That's great. But then you're so tired from all that waiting and just like, cleaning the rims or cleaning your brushes or shaking the glaze. It really, it really is like, I think not like difficult challenging, but just like mentally challenging because it's not stimulating. Yeah. It's tedious. So glaze days are the longest and the least fun for me (laughs) anyways, because I don't dip. I hand brush everything. So it takes extra long. Yep. I do too. 
whenever it's glaze day, I'm like, I like have it on my planner and I'll be like, it's glaze day. So, you know, I'm going to get the glazing done and I'm going to load the kiln and I'm going to throw some stuff. And my husband is like, no, you're going to glaze half the pots and then we're going to go to bed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it always takes way too long to glaze. I'll be like, oh, it'll be a quick two hours. And then like three to five hours later, I'm like, oh. And I didn't even get as much done as I wanted. That's that's not good. <laughs> uh, I feel I think we all struggle with the glazing. That's why a lot of people want to dip. I, I like brushing too because I like to have everything out like a mad paint woman. Mm -hmm. And then I might do weird stuff. I don't know. If, I, if I'm dipping, I'm less likely to do weird stuff. Exactly. I never plan ahead for glaze day. I have no idea what color a piece is going to be until glaze day. So it's really like spur of the moment. And also I don't own enough glaze to have gallon buckets to dip them in and i don't want to like buy a gallon of one color and have it just kind of sit there and not be used for like months because i don't go through mm -hmm. glaze too fast yeah. but like i don't think i could afford just having gallons and gallons of glazes at the moment i'm, I'm good with the 16 ounce jars i understand for sure yeah. what kind of glazes do you like to use my go-to glaze is by amico and it's called the potter's choice glaze Mm, I like um i love them because they have really good layering effects and they also have like a catalog online that shows you how the colors come out uh, depending upon how you layer them so it's a super predictable glaze and it's usually not too runny there are some glazes that run a little bit but i know that so i always plan ahead just be like okay just do the top make sure there's a bigger lip at the bottom for the glaze to not run over and you're good and i've almost never had a problem with running glaze so I just kind of stick to Amico Potter's Choice because I'm like, I don't want to veer off the path and kind of make a big mistake. And everyone loves the combinations that I use. So it's not like I need to try something new. Like it's not like they're getting boring or like old or stale. But I think they also came out with new glazes. So I think I could try those. The Potter's Choice Amico glazes that are new, I could try those. But I'm good with a few I use. I really like them. Hey, if it ain't broke, you ain't gotta fix it. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, these colors are great. They're timeless. I don't I, I don't see any problem in these colors, so I might as well not change. No, for sure. I mean maybe one day you will. But you don't I think to. if I have the time and like the pieces, the spare pieces, because like obviously I'd have to glaze them. <laughs> and that, oh, and yeah, we talked right? about that. Like if I had to glaze with a new glaze I don't know how to use or don't know what to expect and it turns out yeah. ugly, I'd be really bummed like bummed. I'd be like, Oh Do you ever make tiles? Um, I've seen people make tiles and I think I kind of know how to make tiles because you just like throw a rim and then you cut them, the rim oh, into you can pieces. Do those, or you can just, you know, squeeze a little clay nugget, smush it down. And... Yeah, there's that too. Uh, I just feel like, um, I, I don't know. I'd rather just test it on like a small cup or something useful. So even though it turns out ugly, you can still use it instead right. of being like, okay, this tile's going in the garbage. <laughs> I, I gotcha. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. That's awesome. So... What's your favorite part of the process then? If glazing is the bottom. Of glazing the is definitely the bottom. <laughs> um, throwing is probably at the top end. Like just sitting at the wheel with clay. Yeah. And, and I think the top, the top clay is probably porcelain because it is so soft and it feels mm. so amazing on your hands when you're throwing. There's absolutely no grog. And even though it's the most like full of attitude clay, it's still the most like softest, amazing clay you can throw with. It's still hard to throw with because, like, you have to throw thin, and then if you throw too thin, it collapses. But that's a whole other thing. I think just the feel of porcelain is amazing. Um, and then I think hand building is in the middle because I don't hate it, but I, I just don't like that it takes, like, days to move on to the next step. And that's, like, after rolling out a slab and cutting it out, you have to wait a day or two for it to harden so you can actually put it together. That kind of bothers me just because of the workflow gets slowed down a little bit. But other than that, like putting pieces together and then kind of making sure the joints are tight and adding the extra slip or clay to your joints is kind of like satisfying almost. And pricing hand building stuff is always tricky for me. Yeah. I'm like this took this took my whole life. <laughs> $8,000. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, I don't think you understand all the skill that and time and energy that went into this. And you're like, it's just a box. <laughs> So porcelain and mm -hmm. this very soft clay. I've, th I've, I've thrown with it. It is soft. I would say I throw with like pool sand, dirt, ground stuff. It's like real. I throw with real groggy stuff. It, is it like groggy beamings? No, I use um, local stuff from. So I, I throw with a lot of clay. Uh, 
and my favorite clay is my reclaim, but like I like reds. Uh, I got like Cinco Rojo from Armadillo Clay down here in Texas, and then oh. I have like a speckled. I have a speckled clay that I get from my local clay store. That's it's not like speckled buff where it's the salt and pepper kind mm. of speckles. It's big fat speckles. Oh wow! I love those. And that reacts with the glaze, right? Too. Oh reacts. yeah, it that's perfect. bleeds through most of them. Unless some some of my glazes that have heavy tin in them, it doesn't. Oh, I see. Much. Okay. There's a lot of opacifier sometimes. It's, but I like that effect too. But all these clays I use are super groggy. And like for a long time, I would burn my hands centering on the bottom because oh. of the grog. Like because you get it against the wheel and then you're. And then it just kind of rubs on your skin. Yeah. So porcelain holds the glaze really well too. Or do you think that's part of why you use it? Porcelain for bright colored pots, yes. If you use really bright glaze, because porcelain's such a white clay. The glaze on that clay after it's high fired is amazing. I do use speckled brownstone, which is a much darker clay compared mm-hmm. to porcelain. And some of the bright clays just don't show up very well on a speckled brownstone, which is fine because it's a brown clay and that makes sense. But if you're wanting a more like tropical pot for your tropical tree, then a, a porcelain pot would be the way to go. What kind of trees do you envision in your pots or what um, custom orders I would have, have to say in? tropical. For the most part, because I glaze my pots pretty vibrantly. I know a lot of people have come up to me and be like, oh, can you glaze it in a more like neutral or earthy tone? I'm like, yes, I can do that. But if I'm making pots out of my own volition, I would just glaze them really brightly because the glaze looks cool and the pot would look, it would stand out more and it would just look all around more vibrant. I'm with you. I make pots in all caps too. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just like I need it to stand out and I get that in the practice like you don't want your pot to stand out too much because it takes away from the tree but I'm like well maybe your tree isn't like loud enough then. <laughs> that's, that's exactly how I feel and yeah. also I think there's a thing right like so on, on a pond on a bonsai because bonsai and you know the pot the tree and the pot are a partnership and yeah exactly partnership can be set up any kind of way mm-hmm. you know and in in tree spaces a lot of people talk about looking at the tree and not caring about the pot. And I think that's a heavy one-sided kind of way. And then there's a balancing, which is another kind of way. And then maybe there's another side of people who go, you know what? I really like the pot. I think the pot's great. I I think there is a a big variation. (laughs) And I think it's up to like what you prefer, not, not Mm -hmm. as like a, a, a competition is, Oh, who has the best balance, but like, how do you want your tree to look with your pot? And how do you want your pot to look with your tree? Or, and there's also like the tables that you can put those on the little stands. That's a whole nother aspect that people fight mm-hmm. about too. And I'm like, oh, yeah. maybe it's just like a personal thing where like, this is your tree. Sure. You can do whatever you want to do with it. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. But I guess that's up for debate too. Kind of. I think it depends on your goals, right? Like if your yeah. goal is that you want to, you want to be in a, in a space of people who are, have a rule book out and they're pushing their glasses up their nose and going, this is what it should be. <laughs> well, if you're aiming to be in that space, then you're going to have to look at the rule book. Probably, exactly. You know? And there's a lot of rules. <laughs> For sure. But if you're just like, I'm going to make super cool trees and they're going to be great. And I'm going to post it on my Instagram and I'm going to do weird art stuff. And like, I'm going to express myself and I don't really care what the rules are. But then, you know, there's room for anything. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. You just have to like figure out where you want to be, you know, and both places are fine places to be. Yeah, you got to learn how to like break the rules in a certain way to make them look cool, you know? Yeah, kind of. Or just like disregard them completely outside of function. Yeah, as long as you can get your tree out of the pot without breaking it, I think anything goes. <laughs> yeah, and it drains and it's... Exactly, like the tree can live in it. That's another like pro- like po- um, important aspect. But it is 2023 and people will put a tree in anything. Oh yeah, like... I've seen I've seen trees go where they shouldn't be, like on like cliffs or inside a sign or... Trees will put themselves where they shouldn't be. Yeah. You can see my gutters. And I'm like, well, how did I kill this tree? If this tree's over here, like, right? living life to the fullest in the weirdest spot possible. <laughs> right. It makes you wonder so sometimes. True. So you take custom orders? I do. I do take custom orders. Um tell- Tell me all about that so that people listening can reach out to you and give you all the custom orders. Well, it's a pretty simple thing. Um, I use PayPal for the most part. I do accept like Venmo, Apple Pay, and all other sorts of things. But PayPal has this thing called like PayPal invoice. And Mm -hmm. I can write up what you want in your pot, like all the details and the terms and conditions. I can put the price on there and then you can pay like a small portion. Like I usually do 30% for the down payment. 
and then you don't have to pay the rest until like shipping day and i can also add the shipping cost on there because i won't know it until shipping day because then with the weight and the the packaging in the box and then the box size i gotta all enter that in so by the time shipping day comes around i can enter in the shipping costs you'll have the cost of the pot the details the terms and conditions you'll already have that down payment down and in between that time between the down payment and shipping day you can pay whenever so if you want to do increments of payment you can totally do that if you want to pay all of it in like two weeks you can totally do that if you want to pay all of it on shipping day you can totally do that it's very flexible and i love that because then there's also the recording of payments and that keeps us both up to date through PayPal. So, and PayPal is like kind of a secure payment system. So people have protection, like PayPal protection for buyers and PayPal, PayPal protection for sellers. That's been there as well. And I've never run into an issue where someone was like, oh, I didn't pay or, oh, I forgot to pay. And I sent it out already because I usually send it out after they pay. And I've never had someone like, That's like- um... I think it was like I think maybe like it came broken but because we had proof of like it was packaged properly and we had pictures of the broken pottery that and the packaging was also damaged so like it was clearly rough house they got they got their insurance claim back or they they got their money back and I got my money back for the work I did and their money back for shipping so it was like super easy hassle free stuff nice I just yeah, learned so, so much about PayPal yeah, PayPal, I mean, there is that, like, fee there, but that fee's always been there. It's just, like, extra tools that they added on top recently with the PayPal invoicing and all the invoicing accessories and stuff. I really enjoy using it because it's good to track everything. You can track payments. You can track progress. Like, I can post pictures on there. Um, I can put your tracking information on there. So, like, when I send the shipment, I can put the tracking information on the invoice so it's in one spot. It's really nice. That is really awesome. I use PayPal, too. I didn't know as much about it as I do now, though. <laughs> yeah, you can just get the app or just do it on your desktop. Either way works. Sweet. You've got a really great system for your custom orders. So do people just send you a DM on Instagram? Yeah, it's usually a DM, an email, just any way to reach out to me. Um, I would say a lot of them come from Instagram, Facebook, and Reddit. Nice. Reddit. Sweet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I actually am the mod of Bonsai Pottery on Reddit. So for all the bonsai pottery needs, people are just like, oh, I like your pots. Let me, let me order one. I'm like, yeah, sure. But other people post on there as well. So I'm glad I'm not like hogging all of the love for bonsai pottery. But I think it's good that um, like the, the, the sub exists and people like posting stuff on there besides just me. And there's other potters on there as well that I would recommend checking out too because they're they have really good pots and a lot of them are a lot bigger pots and i can't master the craft of giant pots for some reason (laughs) i'm just not that good yet i'm stuck at 12 inches right now every once in a while i can squeeze one out that's bigger but it's a a process of learning (laughs) yeah i think it has to do with just the drying and the warping is like the biggest um hurdle for me and i'm like ugh, it's shouldn't be this hard but it is when I get when we get off here, I'll send you a photo of my pile of failure that's next to my kiln. Oh, you have a pile? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, my kiln is really far from my house, so like when I pull them out, I usually lose pots in the bisque and they crack down the center. And, like, oh. Those so like every time I pull one out, I'm like, I'm not carrying this back to the house, and I've just been sticking that's them fair. on the side of the of the shed. And then I was like, I should throw these away. But then there's a small part of me that's like, how tall could this get? You could like save it for like another piece like a giant pottery piece of just like broken pots i told my husband i'm gonna build a, a new studio uh, like a fort <laughs> is there a password for the fort or <laughs> there, there might be I'll let, you, I'll let you know what it is so okay perfect come, come hang out anytime you want awesome <laughs> so what are your goals going forward with your ceramic process are you trying to make it a full-time gig or are you just expressing yourself I would love to do it full time. Um, There are a few hurdles that I still got to work through to get there. But full time is definitely one of my goals. Getting better is always a goal. It's just something I always want to do. I always want to improve my skills, my workflow, my abilities and stuff like that. And then also just to like create stuff for people. Like I don't necessarily want to create for just me. I want to make useful things for other people to use in their everyday life. Because people do need stuff, whether it's a bonsai pot or a mug or a plate, you know, anything really. And I want to be able to create something that's useful and 
brings joy to someone else. On your Instagram feed, I noticed that it said that you were working through depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's also deals with a lot of social anxiety, yeah. how would you say that that affects your, your work and your process and your output? I think it kind of either stops me from going to the shop or um, prevents me from like being consistent at the shop. So if I want to go to the shop, there's this either, do I have enough energy? Do I feel like going? Or if there is no, if there is enough energy, then it's like, do I want to go and be social with these people? Cause there might be people at the shop and it's not like the people at the shop are like rude or mean. They're actually very nice people, very welcoming. And I enjoy talking to them, but that anxiety kicks in like, Oh, what if they ask me a question I don't want to talk about? Oh, what if I say something that upsets somebody and now there's tension? It's a lot of like worry that's not necessary. And I can understand that, but it's still there. So that also kind of prevents me from going to the shop and getting stuff done. So at the end of the day, a lot of it's just like, can I make it to the shop? And if I get there, will I be able to focus? Absolutely understand. It, I, it's a battle. I feel like I always, mm -hmm. um, something I've, I've said is it, it's me and my audacity versus me and my anxiety. Yeah. And they're like a, a duality. Like there's the audacity to want to like go out and do it. And then the anxiety of like, oh, well, I don't know. And yeah. I'm, it makes you I second guess yourself. Yeah. And also the overthinking. It's like, like I can go and do the thing and then sometimes feel okay while I'm doing the thing. And then it's like I somehow like held up floodgates. And then when I get home, it's like the floodgates come down and I am sitting here in a rumination stew of yeah, like things that, that don't happen. matter. And I'm like, and then I sit here and I tell myself mentally, I'm like, hey, Tori, word to Tori, this does not matter. Those people are not thinking about you negatively. And then, you know, but then the body feeling is still there. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 it's draining. Like a physical response. It's a very draining process. And if you're like fighting that all day, even, and then you try to go to the shop afterwards, it's like, it's like, it's a whole nother battle just to get there, let alone be there and then get stuff done. And it's, in, it's involuntary, which I think anyone who has anxiety can understand that part. It's, uh, mm -hmm. and for anyone who doesn't, it's good to understand. I think that it's not something that anyone chooses to do. Yeah. I mean, I would definitely choose not to do it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, It's not something you want. Well, just from my perspective as an outsider, your work is very great. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you're it. You're doing excellent work, and I've enjoyed talking to you also. So thank if, you're, you. if, we're, if we're both sitting around thinking about this later, just know that I had a great conversation, and I had a really good time. Thank you. Me Let's, too. <laughs> let that be your overriding thought. So do you have anything else that you'd like to add about Anything? Um, I can't think of anything. I think we touched base with basically everything about like the process of me going to the shop, how I do my um, mm -hmm. work, how I get pots done. Um, I can't think of anything. If somebody was going to like get started into ceramics tomorrow, what kind of advice would you give them? I would tell them to be patient with themselves because pottery is not something that is fast and easy. It is a very difficult craft that takes time and patience. It's also a little messy, so don't wear like your best clothes to the potter shop either. <laughs> when you are learning how to do something in, in pottery world or you're trying to do something, just be patient with yourself and recognize that some of these things take time. You're not going to get it the first time, and it's always great to start over if you need to. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's excellent advice. So where can people find all of your work online and where can they buy it? Um, I do have a website. It's a Shopify website. And the link is kind of long, but I do also have a link in bio tool called Linktree. So mm -hmm. it would just be the Linktree link at slash Rebecca Papez. I'm sure we could add the link to this podcast somewhere. It will and definitely I'll... be in the show notes. Yeah, I could I can give that to you as well. So For it's sure. just the Linktree. It'll have all my socials, my Instagram, my Facebook page, my email. It'll have my website from Shopify and even my YouTube. Sweet. Mm -hmm. Maybe YouTube? That's yeah, I'd have made a few videos. Awesome. There you go. Sub your YouTube and join your Reddit. Yeah, it's the Bonsai Pottery <laughs> Reddit. So it's not it's not my Reddit, it's the pottery, the Bonsai Pottery Reddit. So oh, like, okay, I gotcha. I'm just a mod, but like it's for Bonsai Pottery. So anything uh -huh. about Bonsai Pottery is welcome. Sweet, sweet, sweet. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Becca, for taking the time to give me an hour of your day. Yeah, no problem. This was a great time. Talk pots. Awesome. Thank you. And we're going to... This podcast is brought to you by Blue Nose Trading, which is me and all my patrons. You can get early access to unreleased podcast episodes and YouTube videos by becoming a patron of my work at patreon.com slash bluenosetrading. You can find all my current available ceramic work on my website, bluenosetrading.com. For social media links and information about today's featured artist, be sure to check out the show notes. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Remember that you have great ideas that are worth exploring, drink lots of water, and I will see y'all next time around.